Okay, it's nine o'clock, let's get started. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. I was wondering if I'd have like three people here today, but um, glad you're here. Let's, uh, we have a ton of stuff I wanna do today, all right? So let's see how this goes. <clears throat> Last class, we showed that we can rewrite the function sine of x in this Maclaurin series, as this Maclaurin series. And so I want us to take a step back and just remember, what we're saying is that we have a new way to represent the sine function, right? A new way. Now, in order to get this formula, we have to, we have to actually be able to take a bunch of derivatives of this, right? So what I'm getting at is <clears throat> we're trying to create a new function from an old function, right? This new power series, new Maclaurin series from this. What we still have not shown, or what I have not shown for this problem, is what is the radius of convergence? In other words, this is equal to this, but remember when we were doing the previous section, we had these restrictions. When we were doing the one over one minus x, we said that that turned into this thing. But we said that only worked when the absolute value of x was less than one, so that was very restrictive as to when we could convert this to this. So the question naturally becomes, when can we use this instead of this, right? When is it valid? So we need to figure out the radius of convergence of this. So I'm gonna do it for this one. I'm not gonna do it for every problem we do today. But for this one, I wanna show it, all right? So for us, I want us to find capital R. Now, I'm not asking for the interval of convergence. I'm just asking for the radius of convergence. <coughs> So let's do this. Do you all remember how to find the, the radius of convergence for a series? Hmm? Ratio test. We're going to run the ratio test on this series right here. So we're going to take a look at this right here. We're going to run the ratio test on that. All right? So let me do that. I'm going to erase this part. I'm going to use this part of the board here. So I'm going to run the ratio test on this right here. So I'm gonna move kind of fast here. I'm gonna take the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna plug n plus one in everywhere I see an n, right? So let me try that first. I'm gonna have negative one, negative one to what power? If I replace this, hey, what's up? If I replace that with n plus one, I get n plus two, right? So that'll be n plus two. Okay, then I'm gonna have x to the, all right, be careful here. If I replace that n with n plus one, it'll become two n plus three. Good, two n plus three. And then over, um, I, I have a handout. Make sure you get a copy of the handout. If there's extras here, there's extras there. Are there enough over there? There's, I gave you a few, right? Caleb's hoarding, hoarding them over there. All right, now, right here, what do I get when I replace n, n with n plus one here? 2n plus, two n plus three again, right? So 2n plus three and then factorial. Okay, then I'm supposed to divide that, right? Divide this by that, which is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So I'm just gonna go straight to the multiplication of the reciprocal. 2n plus one factorial over the negative one to the n plus one, and then x to the two n plus one. All right, so what I wanna know is when I take this limit, does this thing, what makes it less than one, right? Did everyone get a copy? Still need one there? Do you have, uh, you, hold on, I have some more over here. Do you have a question, Ash? Where? Right here? Yes. So if I write two and I replace n plus n with n plus one, right here, okay. right? And then you distribute the two. So you get two n plus two and then plus one still. Right, I was curious what that didn't happen on the first term, the negative one, because... Well, two, well, if you replace n, I don't have a two in front of this. Right. So if I replace it with n plus one and then I still had a plus one, it'll become 
become n plus 2, right? So there's no distribution of a 2 through. Yes? Exactly. We're going to start to cancel some factorials here. We're also going to cancel some x to the n. So let me rewrite this as limit n goes to infinity. Okay. I'm going to ignore the negative ones, right? Because those, no matter what they turn out to be, absolute value is going to kill them off. Okay. I'm going to rewrite this, this factor as x to the 2n times x cubed, right? That's what that is. And then check this out on the bottom. 2n plus 3 factorial, 2n plus 3 is bigger than 2n plus 1, right? So watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to start rewriting this as a factorial. I'm going to start going, okay, that's 2n plus 3, right? Then it's 2n plus 2, and then it's 2n plus 1, right? What I'm doing is I'm taking, like, any, any number factorial is that number times 1 less than it, times 1 less than it, times 1 less than I keep going, right? So I've just peeled off the first one, the second one, and then here, from here on down, isn't that just factorial? Like from here down, that's just 2n plus 1 factorial the rest of the way. Do you all see that? I've peeled the first two factors off of the front of this thing. Questions? Now I stopped at 2n plus 1 factorial. Why? Because that's what I have up here, right? <coughs> and that's going to allow me to cancel the 2n plus 1 fact factorials. And then this I'm going to write as x to the 2n times x. Okay? Y'all just ask questions, all right? I'm, I'm moving, I'm in a different gear today. So start canceling things out. x to the 2n, x to the 2n, 2n plus 1 factorial, 2n plus 1 factorial, right? So let's see what we're left with. We have, I'm going to try, my, I'm recording today, but I, my camera only goes to about right here. So I'm going to try and stay as much as I can over here. Um, let me do it right here. I'll just erase this. Okay, so this will be equal to limit and goes to infinity. Absolute value. Okay, what do we have left here? Um, I've got that, that right there over x, right? So that's an x squared, right? I'm going to put that over here on the side. And then anything else I have that doesn't have x in it is going to go in front. So on top, all I have is a 1, right? A 1. On the bottom, I have these two factors. So 1 over 2n plus 3 times 2n plus 2. And what happens if I let n go to infinity right now? Zero. This goes to 0, right? Which means that it doesn't matter what x is. This thing's going to go to 0, which is always less than 1, right? This thing goes to 0, the whole thing. Goes to 0, which is always less than 1, which means, according to the ratio test, that this series converges absolutely, absolutely but For every value of x, right? No matter what x I plug in, I get this to be less than 1, which means that my radius of convergence, where this thing converges, is infinite. I can take any x value I want. So I have here that the radius of convergence is infinity. Now, I can actually tell you what the interval of, conver interval of convergence is as well. That's from negative infinity to infinity. What that tells me is that this representation of sine x that I've come up with, right, the Maclaurin series, is valid for any value of x. And I'm going to prove it to you with a picture, okay? Right there you have the graph of sine of x, all right? And then I'm going to start creating the series, all right? This, this blows my mind every time I do this. This right now, what you see, this black line, that's x, just the, just the function x. And remember what our, our Maclaurin series was. It was x minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed <coughs> plus 1 over 5 factorial x to the fifth minus 1 over 7 factorial x to the seventh plus dot, dot, dot forever, right? Right now, you're seeing just the first term graphed, and it sucks, right? It's not, a good, it's not an accurate representation of what sine is. 
But now I'm going to start adding more of these on and watch what happens. Take away those traces. Look at this. Do you see it? Do you see the black? What am I doing? I'm creating the sine function, right? And the further out I go in the series, I'm just going to continue uh, down the left side and down the right side forever. And so it's not like the previous, some of, some of the previous Maclaurin, or some of the previous series we've seen in the past are only good, good approximations of our function on just a little interval. This Maclaurin series is good always, all right? So now, let me point something else out. Do you all agree that when you look at this, let me back it up just a little bit. <coughs> okay, this was just, just the first term is a pretty shitty approximation, right? Of sine. If I do the first two terms right there, let me zoom in on this. Would you agree just using the first two terms, just the first two terms, it's pretty good, right? It's pretty good, but only near, near here, right? If I go outside of that, this black function is not a good approximation, right? But near zero, this is the y-axis, near zero, near x is zero, that's pretty good, right? So in a physics class, or some other class, engineering class, you'll often see this. Sine x is approximately x minus one-sixth x cubed. You'll be in some engineering class, some you know, mechanical engineering class, or you'll be in some physics class, and you'll have some expression. It'll have sine x in it, and all of a sudden they'll replace it with this. And you're like, what the hell? Why are they replacing it with this? These aren't the same functions, right? But according to what we see here, this is good, right? This is approximately true near zero. So as long as you're working, remember sine, sine is a function that we deal with angles, right? So as long as your angle is small, right? These are about the same thing. And even sometimes you'll see this. Sine x is just approximately x. That's if you have a really small x. If I back it up again, let me back it up one, one more, right there. We already said this wasn't a very good approximation, but would you agree that near zero it is? Near zero it is. I mean, they basically like lay on top of each other. Now they start to deviate right around here and down here, but if I'm close enough to zero, these are basically the same things, all right? So imagine you're in some very complicated engineering problem and you've got sine x and then you're gonna be allowed to replace it with x. That makes the problem so much easier, right? So we do this a lot in other classes, all right? Okay, any questions? Yes? This limit, right, this limit, the ratio test says that when we run this limit, we need it to be less than one for convergence of the series, right? And what we determine is that regardless of the x I plug in, remember x has to be a number, it can't be infinity. So if I plug a number in, imagine plug in any number you want here. Plug in a billion, right? A billion squared, huge number, right? Doesn't matter. This is gonna go to zero, which is gonna kill that off and eventually it'll become less than one. That happens for every value of x I ever want, right? Which means that the interval where, where this function, where I can say sine x equals that sum, the, when I can say that is always. This is always true. For all x, it's true. <coughs> okay, good? Now last class, I also showed you the Maclaurin series for cosine. Do you remember how we did it? We did it right at the end of class. How did we get it? We took the derivative of this series, right? And I showed you in our formula sheets that in our formula sheets, we have these, right? Now, unfortunately, it's print, printed sideways. But notice on these, let's look at the sine one, which is right here. That's the formula. 
That's the first few terms printed or written out. And then notice on the far right hand side, see what it says? R is infinity. It's telling you that that is valid always. And if you look at that sheet, we have a Maclaurin series for e to the x. We derived that Maclaurin series for e to the x last class. I should point out that we have done in this class, I've shown you the Maclaurin series for e to the x. I've shown you how to get the Maclaurin series for sine x. And then we took the derivative of sine x to get cosine x, right? So we've done all those. Um, 1 over uh, 1 minus x, that was the previous section. And so we, we showed that that series only converges when the absolute value of x was less than 1. So the radius is 1 here. And then tangent inverse, we did that, I want to say last class, maybe the class before. I think it might have been the class before. Um, we showed that power series. And that one is valid on a, there's a restriction. So what I'm trying to get at here is that the only functions that we have an, an infinite radius of convergence on for the power series, the only ones we have are e to the x, sine x, and cosine x. But those are really important functions, so it's good that the Maclaurin series holds for, for all values of x. Okay, we good? All right, I'm gonna move on. All right, I gave you a handout. Okay, I just typed this up this morning, all right? I was like, I, I'm gonna do something different this semester. I'm gonna give my students a very, very clear, like, step-by-step <clears throat> -step what you do to find either the Maclaurin series or the Taylor series for a given function. So, we're gonna do another example, okay? We're about to do another example. And this is a really weird example but it's actually a really important example, all right? So before I start, it's, it's, it's kind of so complicated, I actually wrote some notes up for it because it's, it's uh, I don't wanna make any little mistakes here, all right? So pause the whole idea of series for a minute and I just want you to take a look at something, all right? Let's say I have um, a bucket, okay? And inside of it, I have three things. Okay, three things, and I don't know what they are, whatever you want them to be. I'll call the first thing A, the, first thing, the next thing B, and the next thing C, right? So I have three objects in here, three things. And what I wanna do is I wanna take two objects out, okay? So I wanna choose from this two. <clears throat> How many different ways can this happen? How many different ways can I start with three objects and choose two. So let's just list out the possible outcomes here. I could, I could pick out of here A and B, right? That could have happened, right? Or I could have picked what? C. A and C, and then I could have picked B and C, right? Now, if I'm not concerned about the order, okay, if I don't care about the order of these, just what do I have there now, right? I have A and B is the same as having B and A then this would be the only three outcomes, right? Right, this is the only three outcomes. So if I have three objects and I choose two, there's three ways this can happen. Three ways that can happen, right? Okay, let me change the problem. What if I have 12 objects and I wanna choose five. How many ways can that happen? Do you feel like trying to list out all the outcomes there? No, right? But do you understand what you would do? You list out 12 objects, so maybe like A, B, C, D, whatever, to 12 of them, right? And then start doing, okay, you could have A, B, C, D, right? Five things, and then you could, we'd be here all day, wouldn't we? We'd be here all day. So there is an actual way we can do this using a mathematical um, operation. Some of you have probably seen this before. There's a special notation for it. If you have k objects, so I'm gonna say how many ways? I don't know how many ways, okay? I, I don't feel like trying, right? But it turns out that if you have k objects and you wanna choose n of them, then first of all, here's the notation we use for that. 
you'll see it um, K C N K choose N is one notation we use another notation we use so this is notation here when someone writes K C N that means K objects choose N of them another notation is this K up here and down here that's the one we're going to use All right again let me point out to you that when you were doing this when we choose these okay when we choose these right here the order does not matter okay order does not matter In other words, I, I think you'll understand this, but what I'm saying is that AB is the same as BA. There is another formula if you want the order to matter, which means that AB is distinct and different than BA. That's called permutations, and we do KPN, but I'm not even going to get into that, all right? I'm just going to stick with this one. All right, so this is, the, this is the notation. This is notation. Now, the formula, all right? Here's the formula for it. The formula for this is k factorial over n factorial times k minus n factorial. <coughs> That's the formula. I'm not going to go into the like, proof of this, all right? We could prove it, but it's, well, we as in we human beings can prove this, all right? And here we're not going to prove it. But let's just check that it works. Can we check that it works? At least verify it works for our, for our example right here. If I ask you to do um, 3 choose 2, right, which is the same as me writing 3, 2, then what you're going to do is 3 factorial on top. Bless you. That's K factorial, right? Bottom left corner is, is what? Going to be for us. 2 factorial. And then times, uh, let's see, k minus, so 3 minus 2 factorial. Do you all see that? That's just plugging in. Okay, the top is uh, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, right? Over 2 factorial is 2 times 1. And 3 minus 2 is 1, so that's uh, 1 factorial, that's 1. You all following? And uh, I'm just going to cancel some things out here. What is this? 3, right? So it works. I think it works. At least it worked that time, right? What if, uh, what if I have this? Three, choose nothing. How many different ways do you think you can do this? Before we do the comp computation, how many different ways? If I give you three objects in a bucket and I say, how many ways can you choose none of them? There's only one way you could do that. Just don't choose anything, right? Okay, so let's check the formula. This would be... 3 factorial over, what's the bottom here? One. 0 factorial, right? And then this minus this, which is 3 factorial. And those cancel, leaving you a 1 on top and then 0 factorial, but we already showed that 0 factorial is 1, right? Remember gamma function, I proved that all to you. Okay, so this is just 1. So there's only one way to choose no objects from 3. Got it? Let's keep going. How many ways can you do three objects, choose three of them? So you have three objects in the bucket, and I want you to take out three. How many ways can you do that? One. Just one way. Let's just confirm it. Three factorial over three factorial, and then three minus three is zero factorial. And again, you get, you get one, right? This making sense? How about this? <clears throat> this is an important one. Three choose four. What do you think? I'm seeing there's no way this can happen, right? There's no, there's no way you can, if you have three objects in a bucket, and I say, hey, take out four of them, right? How many ways can you do that? There's no ways you can do this, okay? Let's try the formula. We get 3 factorial, right, over 4 factorial, and then here's where there's the problem. 3 minus 4, negative 1. So you have negative 1 factorial, which for us is undefined, right? So what we have is that anytime you have 
in general, when you have k choose n, right, that will be equal to this. <coughs> so long as what? k is greater than or equal to n, right? As long as k is greater than or equal to n, that number is bigger than or equal to this one, then this should be true, right? But what do we get if you have k choose n and k is less than n? What should your answer be? Not undefined. Think about it again, like three objects, take four of them out. We get zero, right? There's no way that can happen. Okay, y'all good? That's the first thing we need to get in place before we get to this series. Um, the next thing I need you to see is a little bit harder. All right, Let's see if you can, if I can convince you of this. I want to show right now. Okay, I want to show. I'm going to have to. I'm going to try and convince you of this. That. Um, k times k minus 1 times k minus 2 times k minus 3 all the way till you get down to k minus, just double check this, yeah. K minus, this is going to look weird, um, N minus 1 all over N factorial. Okay, that's a very weird looking thing, right? I'm, I'm going to try and show you right now, see if I can convince you of this, that this is equal to the formula we just had k factorial over n factorial, and then k minus n factorial, okay? I want to show that this is true. Right now, I'm telling you it's true. I'm telling you this is true, but I, I want you to be convinced that it is, all right? So can I try and convince you? Let's, let's first, <clears throat> let's first, and also I should state here, you know, here k is greater than or equal to n, all right? Because we know that when it's not, it's not defined. So, <clears throat> so um, let me see. I want to try and convince you that these two are the same. So let's do it with a specific example first. Okay? Let's do it with a specific example. Let's say that k is equal to 8. Uh, let's go bigger. Let's say k is 12, and let's say n here is 4. All right? Then what am I trying to prove to you then? What is this expression if I replace k with 12 and n with 4? Let's write it out. The left side is, what do I start with? 12, then 11, let me do it this way. Yeah, I'll do it in parentheses. 11, then 10, right? And when am I going to stop? 9, when do I stop? When I get to this, what would this be for us? So I'm going to go down here. I stop at 12, take away, what? <coughs> 4 minus 1. Do you all see? It's just me replacing the k with 12 and then the n with 4. All over this right here, right, n factorial, which would be 4 factorial. So I'm going to say 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Right. Isn't, that, isn't that what the left-hand side of, of the thing is? Yes? Okay, what is this, though? What is all this? So that's 3, right? What's 12 minus 3? 9? Oh, shit, then I would have stopped here. Let's just do it. Let's just put 9 here. That's where I'm supposed to stop. So let me take this one out. I would stop at 9 there, right? Okay, is that, the question is, is that equal to, now let's plug in those same things over here. Okay, let's plug them in over here. So on top I would have what? 12 times 11 times 10 times 9, all the way down though, right? All the way down. I'm going to keep going. 8, 7, 6, 
five, four, three, two, one, right? That's k factorial on the top. Then the bottom I have n factorial, right? That's this. Four times three times two times one. And then times k minus n. For us, that's what? 12 minus four, which is nine, right? 12 minus four, sorry, I said that wrong. Eight factorial, right? 12 minus four is eight factorial. So I would have times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. Yeah? Okay, check it out. Eight's gone, seven's gone, six, five, four, three, two, one. And what are you left with? 12 times 11 times 10 times nine over four factorial, right? 12 times 11 times 10 times nine over four factorial. Now, I only, I only convinced you for one particular choice of k and one particular choice of n, right? That's not a proof in any, any, by any means, right? But it's at least leading us to believe this is true, right? So now let me see if I can convince you without actually replacing k with 12 and, and, and n with 4. Let me see if I can convince you. And the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to leave that on the board. And what I'm going to do is work with this side right here. OK? So pay attention to what I do here. The top k factorial is k, k minus 1, k minus 2, right? Dot, dot, dot. And that goes all the way down to 1, doesn't it? I'm going to put the 1 way down here. OK? That's the numerator. Got it? Then I have the bottom left corner is n factorial. And then this one, let's start writing this out. That's k minus n. What would the next one after that be? k minus n minus 1. k minus n minus 1. Good. k minus n minus 1. So one less than this one, right? What would the next one be? k minus n. But now I take away how many? Two, right? One from this, right? So another one, so you're going to take away two. And then k minus n, then minus three. And then all the way down till I get to one. Agreed? <clears throat> now, I left all this blank for a reason. Somewhere in here, right? Somewhere in here is this, right? Somewhere in there is this. So I'm going to do it in a different color. Somewhere in here is k minus n, right? Somewhere in there is that. And then the next one would be k minus n minus 1, and then so on and so forth, yes? The big question is, since these are all going to cancel, you see how this is going to cancel with this? This is going to cancel with this all the way down to 1? What's the one right in front of this? What's the one right in front of this one? <coughs> 